Hello and welcome to Future Squared. Stephen Hawking once said that intelligence is the ability to adapt to change, so let's adapt. My name is Steve Glaveski, and each week I'll bring you conversations with preeminent thought leaders from a variety of fields to help you think in a multidisciplinary way, keep goals in your professional and personal life, and better navigate what is fast becoming a brave new world. Future Squared is brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation accelerator that works with organizations to unlock their people's latent potential to create more impact for humanity and lead more fulfilling lives. If you need help driving your organization's innovation strategy, visit collectivecampus.io. And without further ado, come with me if you want to live. So you would start the day with, let's spend 10 minutes talking about this European history, but let's compare. Okay, we're learning about the French Revolution. Let's review what we learned in the American Revolution because it influenced. And by creating those connections, you would do what's called spaced repetition. And there, there's really no way to force something to stick in your memory without spaced repetition. Our brains are highly, highly effective at forgetting because they're highly efficient machines. They, they comprise 2% of our body mass, but use up 20% of the resources. And so they have to be very, very efficient um, to function properly. There's two dedicated centers in the brain called the hippocampi. Most people don't realize you have two of them, one in the left, one in the right. And it's, its primary job is to forget. And you can trick it, you can make things more attractive to it, you can serve things up on a silver platter, but at the end of the day, the algorithm goes, how often do I use it? and how important is the stuff that it's connected to. Welcome back to Future Squared for episode number 313 with Jonathan Levy. Before we get into today's episode, Employee to Entrepreneur, How to Earn Your Freedom and Do Work That Matters, my brand new book, has been in bookstores for three weeks. If you've picked up a copy, I would really love it if you took just a minute of your time to review the book on Amazon.com. It would go a long way to increasing the organic reach and exposure of the book. If you haven't picked up a copy and you need further convincing, check out the free bonus bundle over at EmployeeToEntrepreneur.io. Now for today's podcast. Jonathan Levy is an experienced entrepreneur, angel investor, and life hacker from Silicon Valley. Since 2014, Jonathan has been one of the top performing instructors on Udemy. With his course, Become a Super Learner, earning him over 60,000 students. He has since snowballed this success into the launch of his rapidly growing information products company, Superhuman Enterprises, which produces such products as the award-winning Becoming Superhuman podcast, which I was lucky enough to be a guest on, the best-selling Become a Super Learner, digital and audio books, and numerous online courses. He's also the founder of Super Learner Academy and Branding You Academy, two private online academies where he teaches premium level masterclasses in accelerated learning, productivity, and entrepreneurship. In addition to publishing his own best-selling book, Levy has been featured in such publications and programs as The Wall Street Journal, Inc. Magazine, TEDx, Entrepreneur on Fire, Mixergy, Dream Think Do, Nana Tan Television, The Silicon Valley Business Journal, and The Solopreneur Hour, just to name a few. Jonathan is a voracious learner, which will probably come as no surprise, and I enjoy chatting with him and going down all sorts of rabbit holes pertaining to optimizing human performance to excel in both business and have a more rewarding experience of life. We went down many rabbit holes in our hour-long conversation, including one, Jonathan's battle with ADD and depression and how we overcame both of them, two, what we can glean from evolutionary biology in so far as learning and memorization is concerned, and three, building successful online courses and what it takes. Jonathan also offered some tips on how I can accelerate the development of my surfing skills. With that, I bring you the one and only Mr. Becoming Superhuman himself, Jonathan Levy. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Steve. I'm really excited to be here. That's an absolute pleasure to have you on the program. You're joining me all the way from sunny Tel Aviv, Israel. That is true. I'm really thankful to not be in a polar vortex right now. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty insane. What was it, minus 40 degrees Celsius or something to that effect? 
Yeah, and if it gets to like 16 Celsius here, I, I freak out. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I don't even know what it's like to get to minus anything here in Melbourne, Australia. Our winter is like five degrees Celsius, and that's at like three in the morning. Anything below that, I don't know, I might just evaporate. But um, man, you guys have quite the bustling uh, tech and startup ecosystem over there in, in Israel. We really do. It's actually per capita, at least it used to be when I used to follow the statistic, the second biggest startup capital in the world. We have the most startups per capita for citizens, and I think the second most VC funding after Silicon Valley. Mm. Well, why do you think that is? Oh, there's so many good reasons. And I recommend everybody read a book called Startup Nation, mm -hmm. which talks a lot about it. But uh, to kind of summarize the broad reasons, first off, can't deny the role of the military. Every single, pretty much every single 18-year-old in this country gets a two-year crash course in something. And the largest unit in the Israeli military is the 8200 unit, mm -hmm. which is uh, technology, intelligence, counterterrorism. Um, many, many people believe that the Stuxnet worm was developed by the 8200 unit. So imagine you're 18 years old, you've identified yourself and gotten selected to this elite unit, which is tens of thousands and thousands of people, mm. and you get a six-month crash course in all things PHP. And that's the first thing that you do after high school. And then from there, once you graduate, you take that technology, which was maybe cyber Maybe it was antivirus technology. Maybe it was surveillance technology, you know, facial recognition, all these kinds of crazy technologies. And the military really doesn't discourage you from building something based on that. So face.com, the technology that Facebook bought, which identifies who is in what pictures, that was an Israeli startup based on technology developed here in Israel. Mobileye, which is a huge company mm -hmm. that was doing all the... Uh, optical image analysis for Tesla, and they do it for a lot of companies. That's also Israeli technology, Waze, GPS tracking, all these things. So we're really, really good at the kinds of technologies that help a very small country like ours with a lot of people who don't like us. Um, mm. And then on top of that, Israel made a very, very dedicated effort in the 1990s. We unfortunately don't have trade with most, if not all, of our neighbors. Yeah. We're very much isolated. We're an island. So from the beginning of the country, we had to come up with our own agriculture because no one would sell us fruits and vegetables. So Israel has advanced very much in agritech. We had to come up with our own drug industry because local countries wouldn't sell us drugs. So pretty soon Teva became the world's largest generic uh, pharmaceutical manufacturer. So we're an island and we're a very small economy. So we're always looking out to the world to see what problems we can solve. And then I guess the third thing is Israel has the highest number, or used to, I think Canada surpassed us a couple of years ago, the highest number of graduate degrees in the world. In other words, the most educated population in the world, um, which really, really helps. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think there's heaps of valuable lessons to unpack there as far as a lot of these cities around the world who purport to be building the next Silicon Valley, and I hear that pretty much everywhere I go. Um, but in, in the case of Israel, like you said, you know, the, there's unique circumstances um, that underpin uh, the country. Obviously, it's effectively an island. Um, and like you said, there, there's a big focus on agri-tech, um, which makes sense. And when you think about cities like, say, Detroit, um, what their natural, say, domain expertise is in is obviously automobiles, thanks to, um, you know, decades and decades of that space. But that's obviously been slowing down now. Out, but it makes sense that, hey, what's emerging um, in that space, such as drones and autonomous vehicles, perhaps you should take that domain expertise and build, say, a Silicon Valley of um, automobiles rather than just say we're going to be the next Silicon Valley, which it seems every city I go to says, such as Singapore and Hong Kong and even right. Melbourne and Sydney say the same thing. And it's like, look, there's so many factors and variables that influenced why Silicon Valley became Silicon Valley. It didn't happen overnight. It started with the military, you know, seven decades ago. And I think people tend to overlook these little facts. Well, Silicon Valley is a really interesting story that I have to go into, you know, mm -hmm. as a Berkeley graduate. Of course. What happened in Silicon Valley was the gold rush. And then when the gold mines ran out, coal and other kinds of mining. And then it really it was Stanford. And Leland Stanford and Phoebe Hurst and all these kinds of like robber barons who had these huge industry uh, interests, Phoebe Hurst founded Berkeley, not founded, but funded mm -hmm. Berkeley. And part of her reason to this day, it's called the Phoebe Hurst School of Engineering and Mining, um, was because it got harder and harder and harder to pull stuff out of the ground. And so they needed more and more engineers. So Stanford started a university 
and because Harvard wouldn't take his money <laughs> and Phoebe Hearst funded an engineering school and and on and on and on. And pretty quickly, you had two really power, powerhouses in engineering and technology that were just churning out graduates. Well, as we know, mining no longer was the industry. <laughs> and now these engineers started turning themselves to other things. How do we build better railroads? And then it became, how do we build better manufacturing technology? And and on and on and on and on. And it just snowballed forward. But it all came from this investment of industry to say, how do we churn out engineers? Yeah. Yeah. And there was quite a bit of investment that government made uh, in the space, oh, particularly yeah. in the um, semiconductor space in the 60s. I think the industry grew by a factor of something like 10 um, in a few short years, mm -hmm. which just galvanized the entire industry and attracted a lot of uh, venture capital investment. And, and the rest, as they say, is history. Totally. Um, so obviously you speak quite proudly about having graduated from Berkeley. I mean, you are a, you grew up in NorCal, as I understand it, in uh, Saratoga and went to Saratoga High School. Um, and many in our audience who are listening to this might know you as the becoming superhuman guy. But mm -hmm. I want them to get to know the proverbial Clark Kent behind the cape, Jonathan. So while you were at Saratoga High School, you weren't exactly the super learner you are today, right? No, definitely not. I always like to joke with people that you don't start a podcast called Becoming Superhuman because you were happy with who you were growing up. And I definitely was that case. I really, really struggled throughout mm. middle school and high school. I struggled with depression. I struggled academically. I struggled socially. And um, that carried on for years and years and years. I had a really, really tough time of it until I discovered two things. One, a friend of mine introduced me to prescription ADD medication, which helped me at least sit still long enough at home to catch up with all the stuff that I wasn't understanding in class. And yep. I would lock myself in my bedroom for five hours every day trying to figure out what the hell everyone was talking about in class. Hmm. And the second thing I discovered, which I'd known about for years, I mean, I'd been an entrepreneur since I was about four years old, was when I first came to my parents and said, I want to start a company. Um... But that was entrepreneurship. And at age 16, after five or six failed venture ideas, one of them finally caught on and started growing and gave me the self-esteem and confidence to realize, hey, I'm, I'm pretty bad at this school thing, but I'm actually not bad at everything. There's There are some things that I can be good at. I'm not so good on the football field. I'm not so good at the school dances. But this entrepreneurship thing, this creation thing, mm. I actually am good at. And that gave me, for lack of anything else, it gave me confidence and yeah. self-esteem. And, you know, later on in life, you learn that confidence and self-esteem should come from within, not from your achievements. But it was a great step to get me out of the depression and the self-hatred. Yeah. Yeah. And a big believer in the fact that uh, that validation should come from within rather than from other people. And, you know, if you live your life according to other people's opinions, you'll never be rich. I believe it was Socrates who said that. But if you live your life according to nature, you'll never be poor. And um, one other proverb that I was reminded of listening to that story about not being great at school, but being much better at entrepreneurship is if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. And I think it was Einstein who said that. And just on that point, I mean, as you're aware, we run Lemonade stand here, a kids entrepreneurship program. I mean, in, in what specific ways, Jonathan, do you think that the traditional classroom inhibited your learning? A lot of ways. I mean, today, you know, I've spent years since hiring private tutors and, and getting help with accelerated learning. I spent years building upon that knowledge and I'm publishing a new book pretty soon mm -hmm. all about learning because, I mean, one of my earliest memories of school and I didn't know that other people didn't have this, but one of my earliest memories of school is going in after class and having to ask the teacher and going, I still don't understand. I still don't understand. Mm -hmm. And then when it finally clicked for me, and it was something simple like multiplication tables, when it finally clicked for me, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry because I was so relieved, but so overwhelmed that, you know, you're telling me that I have to face this for the next 10 years of my life. Um, there are a lot of things. I, I mean, it's become almost cliche to kind of bash schools in the way that they're designed. But yeah. the biggest thing that I'll say is we're not auditory learners, right? Mm -hmm. We're not meant to sit and listen to someone drone on. And the best schools know this, right? The Muse schools and the Montessori schools know that we're experiential visual learners. We need to experience. If it's not in the hands, it's not in the head. And we need to see things. We need to create vivid memories. We need to leverage our existing knowledge. And, you know, the w the reason that schools can persist this way is because our brains don't fully mature until age 13 or so. And so 
you can sit a kid down and say, learn this because you have to. But along about 12 or 13, which is when I really started to struggle in school, our brains mature. And all of a sudden, we're subject to all these different things that that learning experts have known for decades and decades. We need to actually apply what we learn. It's not enough to learn for the test. You need to apply what you learn. Mm -hmm. We need to know why we're learning what we're learning. We need to connect it to our existing knowledge so that our brains can determine, hey, this, this actually has relevance and pertinence. It's connected to the way that I see the world um, and many, many other things. But the biggest, I guess, indictment that I would say in schools today is that we don't actually use what we learn. And again, this is something that's changing. You know, I, I was in a lecture with the co-founder of Muse and she was talking about how at Muse schools, which is kind of a, a very new age, trendy, uh, it, it's the next generation's Montessori if, mm -hmm. if people haven't heard about it. And, and I'm sure they wouldn't appreciate being compared that way, but it's a, a very new age innovative school. And the teacher was saying, you know, our Students don't learn arithmetic by learning it for the test. They learn arithmetic by starting a school bake sale or a lemonade stand in, in your case, Steve. They don't yeah. learn biology by reading it in a textbook. They do it by cultivating the gardens mm -hmm. and the livestock that we keep on campus. And they learn about plants and they learn about agronomy. And so they're actually applying learning. And what a difference it makes. Yeah. You know? Yeah, totally. And I mean, today you've got so many people um, touting the, say, benefits of listening to audiobooks on 3X and reading, say, a book or two or even three books a week. But something you said there, Jonathan, about the application of what you're actually uh, reading and learning. I mean, how do you strike a balance between that? Because I know you're a massive proponent of speed reading and consuming as much content um, as is I suppose, sufficient to meet your goals. But at what point do you say, okay, that's enough. I really need to be applying more of this because it can be a, I, I suppose people can use learning as a form of procrastination sometimes to stop them from actually taking that step to explore entrepreneurship or whatever it is. That's true. You know, one of the things that we teach in our courses though, is that even if you're not, if you're reading a physics textbook, you're probably not going to get out there and start running a linear accelerator. You mm -hmm. know, I, I doubt that they're going to let you do that, <laughs> but there are a lot of ways, even simple mindset adjustments to harness these requirements for adult learning without even leaving your chair. So one example we give is a skill called pre-reading and it's based on a system that educators have known about for years called SQ3R. Mm -hmm. It's um, essentially survey, question, and then read, review, revise. What we do in the skill of pre-reading, which we've kind of modified and, and tweaked around, is we get people to skim what they're about to read before they read it. And as they're doing that, they're not just looking for things that stand out, which they are doing. They're pointing out different words and starting to generate interest and curiosity. So if I see the word San Francisco, I might think, well, why is San Francisco in here? As I'm pre-reading, as I'm skimming, I'm thinking, who is this information going to benefit? How am I going to use this information? Who are some people that I could talk to that might be interested in learning this? Um, what are some positions that I expect the author to take and how might I agree or disagree. So you're generating all this interest. And even if the use of the information is only a simple conversation or, you know, if I'm reading tax law, well, this could be interesting because it might change the way that I file my taxes in 2018. You know, you're applying that applicability right away. And that right away, I mean, it's, speed reading is controversial, memory techniques less so, but one thing that is proven time and time and time and time again is that the skill of pre-reading is one of the most powerful things you can do. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing that we teach students to do is visual mnemonics, right? Mm -hmm. So as I said earlier, we're visual learners. We evolved over millions and millions and millions of years to learn by visual information. And, and people may say, well, you know, what's the most memorable sense? It's actually smell and taste because that's a pretty big survival advantage to smell when something is rancid or poisonous. Yep. But after that, you know, you can't smell and taste your way through a degree in physics. After that, it's sight. And the reason for that is because sight gives us a lot of really important survival advantages. What are the colors of the neighboring tribes that are friendly and not friendly? What are the shapes of the leaves that are safe to touch, not safe to touch? Mm -hmm. And the truth is sound, although it's a great sense, I have nothing against sound, 
it's not very useful from an evolutionary perspective. Predators rarely announce themselves before they attack. And so over time, our brains have developed what's called the picture superiority effect. So after smell and taste, which are the most memorable senses, they're actually wired directly into the reptilian brain because they predate the mammalian brain. Mm -hmm. Sight is the most memorable sense. And so what we teach people to do is leverage this picture superiority effect and create visualizations for the things that they're learning. And that can take a whole so range of forms. We're talking about memory palaces and things of that persuasion? Even a step before memory palaces. Mm -hmm. uh, memory palaces are great when you need perfect index knowledge of something backwards and forwards, and you never, you don't want to forget a single piece of information. But a step back from that, and you can get very far with just this, is creating a novel visualization, even if it's not connected to a memory palace, mm -hmm. for everything that you want to learn. And what we teach in our course, I mean, that's a very quick thing to learn. The reason our courses are 10 weeks is because they're adaptation strategies to apply that to numbers, names and faces, historical dates, um, foreign language words, Bible verses, anything you want can be visualized with the right technique. I've even developed ways to do it for musical notes mm -hmm. and aspects of music theory, scientific formulas. Um, the visualization part is is pretty quick to learn. It's the adapting it to everything else. And then, as you said, Steve, you know, the the next level strategies are memory palaces and adaptations even on the memory palace technique to get your memory to really bulletproof levels. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually used a memory palace recently for an eight minute stand up comedy gig. And I used visual aids like a doormat. Um, Although I don't think uh, palaces have doormats, so I can't, I'm not sure about that one, but uh, the door, you know, pictures on the wall, cabinets, clocks, the staircase, and each of these little visual cues would prompt me uh, to basically remember what the next line was going to be in that particular joke, whether it was the setup, the punchline, the tagline, and so on. Um, and it just helped me, like, combine... Um, it just helped me rattle off the eight minute set without having to worry about going blank at any point in that particular uh, memory palace, if you will. Um, and it just seems like this is something that hasn't been introduced to say kids in school, let alone in college, which strikes me as somewhat strange given that the standard assessment approach that a lot of schools still uh, use today um, is based on remember and regurgitate. Yeah, something like this could be so powerful for kids. Oh, yeah. I like to sometimes fantasize about what school would have been like if someone had taught me this when I was eight or nine years old. I mean, mm. I, I feel like it would be kind of like coming to a water gun fight with a fire hose. Yeah. Because it's it's so I actually had one student come back to me and quote unquote complain because he got called into the teacher's office for cheating. They were like, you got a perfect score and that's not possible. You must have read the answers. And he goes, I did read the answers. I read them from my memory palace. Mm -hmm. And they just they just couldn't believe it because he'd made such a turnaround as a student. But it, it really is. I mean, once in a while, I'll get bored and I'll go on Facebook Live and I'll, I'll have people rattle off digits. Or mm -hmm. we actually have a, a game platform that rattles off like 50 random digits. Yeah. Um, so, so 25 sets of two numbers. And people are always like, wow, how'd you do that? And I'll, you know, I'll recite the numbers forwards and backwards. And it takes me a, about a minute or two to memorize the numbers. And people are always like, it's so impressive. But it's it's one of those things, once you know how it's being done, it's not impressive at all. Yeah. Like if it, once I show you how I do it and you practice it, you're like, oh, you're, you're literally just reading the numbers off mm -hmm. of a list in your head. Yeah. It's no more impressive, you know. In some ways, it's easier than reading it off numbers in your head because when you are reading it off a list, because when you look at a list, you can transpose lines and your memory palace is pretty hard to transpose lines. Mm. So, so just on memory palaces and, and memory in general, I know a lot of people when they, for example, take an exam, they will completely forget absolutely everything they studied for, they crammed for within say five minutes of walking out of that um, assessment center. Um, I mean, how do you rate your retention today out of a hundred percent based on the techniques that you apply? That's a phenomenal question and, and a phenomenal also misconception because mm -hmm. Ron White, who was the U.S. memory champion a number of times, and I were joking that people like to come up to us and say, hey, you know, I met you five years ago at a conference and you memorized my name and everyone in the audience. And do you remember my name? And the answer is, of course, no. Yeah. And that's because the, the other component to accelerated learning and man, maintaining memory is spaced repetition. So mm -hmm. you can use the best memory techniques in the world and it'll dramatically improve your memory and your ability to memorize and your speed of memorization. But at the end of the day, 
our brains are still subject to what's called exponential memory loss, mm -hmm. meaning the first time you learn something, you forget it almost instantly. The second time it takes maybe half a day. The third time it takes two days. The fourth time it takes five days. Eventually you can push that curve out so that it takes years and years and years, but you have to use the knowledge a lot. And so that's talking about an indictment of a of the school system. That's another issue is once you move on, you're very lucky if you get to use that information again. And usually it's not, you know, once you've finished U.S. history, it's time to move on to European history. And there's no referencing back. If school actually wanted you to remember things, there would be, say, a one month course every year where you go back and review everything you learned in the past years or every class would start with what did we learn last year and how does that relate to this year, right? Mm -hmm. So you would start the day with let's spend 10 minutes talking about this European history, but let's compare, okay, we're learning about the French Revolution, let's review what we learned in the American Revolution because it influenced. And by creating those connections, you would do what's called spaced repetition. And there, there's really no way to force something to stick in your memory without spaced repetition. Our brains are highly, highly effective at forgetting because they're highly efficient machines. They, they comprise 2% of our body mass, but use up 20% of the resources. And so they have to be very, very efficient um, to function properly. There's two dedicated centers in the brain called the hippocampi. Mm -hmm. Most people don't realize you have two of them, one in the left, one in the right. And it's, its primary job is to forget. And you can trick it you can make things more attractive to it. You can serve things up on a silver platter. But at the end of the day, the algorithm goes, how often do I use it? And how important is the stuff that it's connected to? Yeah. And I know you're a big uh, language learner. How many languages have you learned, Jonathan? I'll say three and a half. Three and a half? I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I speak Hebrew and Spanish quite well. Mm -hmm. And along about the way of learning Russian, I learned quite a bit. I came at it years ago with just memory techniques. And let's just say I, I got a lot of material for my book about how not to learn languages because I just approached Russian the wrong way. Yeah, why And that? I learned the wrong words in the <laughs> wrong order. And, right. and I just didn't. I didn't adequately grasp the grammar. So to this day, my Russian is, uh, I probably speak like a four-year-old who was dropped on his head. Okay, that's a fantastic way of putting it. Um, but just on spaced repetition and language learning, I mean, I'm not sure how familiar you are with um, apps like Duolingo, but I've dabbled in that space and I've found that they tend to apply at least elements of spaced repetition where you could be, say, learning, uh, say, German, um, and you could be lesson seven out of 15 lessons, which could take you say three or four weeks. And you might find that in lesson seven, words and phrases from lesson one, two, and three are popping up, but you're just adding additional words to those phrases and forming a complete sentence, um, which in my experience seemed to uh, solidify those neural pathways. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Definitely, yeah. I mean, there's there's also software out there like Memrise, which is created by uh, former memory champion Ed Cook, and Anki, which will mm -hmm. actually use an algorithm, and you tell it how hard a word or a phrase or a flashcard is, and it'll use an algorithm to selectively show it to you the minimum necessary, uh, so you're not reviewing things that you don't need to review. Uh, Duolingo is really, really cool. I think it's amazing to learn a language free. The only word of caution that I would give people is um, remember that on Duolingo, you're the product because yeah. the actual business model of Duolingo is translating stuff for businesses. So the things that you're translating are loosely based on the, the right things to learn in the right order, but mm -hmm. um, you know they, they do have a, an ulterior motive, though I think it's, it's wonderful that they found a way to teach so many people languages for free. Yeah, couldn't agree more. So you mentioned uh, on a number of occasions that you've got a few courses in this space and you've had a few best-selling courses. I mean, your um, courses have been enjoyed on Udemy by over 150,000 students. You've got courses like Become a Speed Demon, uh, Become a Super Learner, Become a Travel Wizard, and you're launching a new course called Branding You. Um, I mean, people who see those numbers, like 150,000 students, when you compare that to the fact that most uh, Udemy courses get maybe 1% of that. Um, and also your Facebook group has almost 100,000 likes. Um, what do you think it is, Jonathan, that sets your courses apart? Well, it's uh, pretty funny. Like when I first built my course, it was supposed to be a side project. Mm -hmm. I wanted to find my next big thing. 
uh, my next big entrepreneurial venture. And I'd sold a business and I had some investments and in, in income. So I only needed to make a little bit more money to have what I called infinite runway. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know that feeling as an entrepreneur where it's like, you kind of got to You got to find your next idea. Well, I didn't want to be rushed and I wanted to take my time and I was, you know, essentially looking for something that would just bring me enough income that I could not be pressured to choose the wrong thing. Mm. And it's a really good thing that I did that because I tried a lot of things and I worked at a lot of different startups and opportunities and I volunteered and I flew to Africa a few times and I flew to Russia a few times. And Mm -hmm. really I, I like tested out the startup ecosystem here and abroad. But, um, what I did when I built my course is I, I really kind of practiced what I preach. I sat down. I didn't know really anything about online courses, and I'd only taken one online course ever. And that was the course that convinced me. I was like, hey, this is really cool. Like, I'm learning a lot. I paid my 50 bucks, and these guys have sold this course thousands of times. And how cool is this? Like, mm-hmm. pre-recorded learning, you know, that's highly effective and blah, blah, blah. Um And so I sat down and I opened like 50 browser tabs and I read everything I could about video editing and online course creation and pedagogical experience design. And I think I spent like a whole weekend doing it. And then I started writing and a month later, I put out the course, you know, I I did everything really, really fast, but all based on all these lessons that I'd learned just sitting at home, watching videos online and reading articles and, and you know, it worked. Uh, the course quickly became one of Udemy's fastest growing and most popular courses. And then we've just continued applying those lessons and refining those lessons that we've learned about online course creation, about video editing. And obviously we're, we're doing it a lot better now than back when I used to tape a blanket on my wall, but, uh, it's all based on just research. I mean, I took things that were readily available, Mm -hmm. uh, resources that taught you how to create online courses and then I just applied what I learned. Fantastic. And I guess um, also, I mean, the fact that today we've got access to so much information, uh, whether it's blogs, books, uh, podcasts, videos, academic journals, uh, I think it's Peter Diamandis who says that people today have access to more information than the president of the United States had 25 years ago. And we're all looking to learn more. Um, We've got information anxiety and Perhaps that's part of the reason why um, the nature of your courses, whether it's speed reading, uh, whether it's memorization, um, I think there is an innate sort of appeal there to, to, to the public because oftentimes when people struggle at entrepreneurship, it's because they've got a value proposition problem, not a marketing problem. And in your case, I think the value proposition is quite clear. So while yes, great video editing and everything else is part of it, I mean, it wouldn't resonate with people unless you had that key sort of um, unique differentiator, which it seems that you have. Yeah, I certainly agree with you. And I definitely, I mean, I know in your book, Steve, you talk about the lean startup as being such a game changer. Mm. I'd read the lean startup and I, I, realized that the lean startup doesn't just have to be about tech products or even about startups. Mm. You can lean startup process your book, your course, your podcast, your anything. And and that's exactly what I did. I posted to my Facebook friends at the time who were kind of my target audience. And I got a ton of really, really valuable feedback. And one of the things people said was, you know, I don't just want a memory course. I want a memory and speed reading course. Uh, I want to make sure I have lifetime access. So I really designed that value proposition around what people told me around consumer research. Yeah. And and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, on the lean startup, you can lean startup anything, even you look at uh, US military strategist, John Boyd, who coined the, the term, the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act, which essentially means the faster you can observe and orient yourself rather to external stimuli, and make a decision, the better off you'll be, particularly if your feedback loop is shorter than that of your competitors, which essentially is the spirit of Lean Startup. It's just about learning faster than everyone else before you run out of that proverbial runway um, in order to find product market fit and a successful business model. Yeah, that and I think one of the biggest things for me was just not being attached to your idea as a fully formed thing. Every Mm. single time that I've started a business with, I have this idea and it's going to be so great and it's going to be so big and here's what it is, I've failed. And every single time I've started with, I see this little opportunity and I think I'm going to start doing something small and then I'm going to learn as I go. Not every time, but many, many times it's worked quite well. Mm. 
just on, on, on that as well, I guess, um, I'm not sure if you've read Atomic Habits by James Clear, but he talks about the fact that in order to maintain a habit, uh, if we identify with it, as in we derive a sense of identity from a particular personal trait or behavior, for example, it could be going to the gym, we're far more likely to stick to that habit. Now, obviously, you've built an identity around becoming superhuman, essentially, and speed reading, memorization, all these techniques you talk about in your various courses. Um, do you feel that that kind of ties you to being this person, or do you feel Find yourself being, say, kind to yourself every now and again and not, say, waking up at 5 a.m. and not doing the um, early morning workout or whatever it is um, to be that superhuman person. Because obviously human beings, um, to a degree, we're, we're fallible. And I guess I'm just curious to get inside the mind of someone who calls their podcast Becoming Superhuman. Are you <laughs> superhuman on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, that's a really good question as well. So first, I will say that with age, I think we become more self-compassionate. Yeah. And I used to try to beat myself into submission. And I see this so much with my students or members of my mastermind, especially the young men among us. We mm -hmm. think that the way is really to beat ourselves into submission. Mm. And I think as we get older, our testosterone comes down a little bit. We calm down. We realize the importance of self self-care and self-compassion. So I'm much more compassionate with myself than I used to be. Uh, but I still always aspire to improve. You know, I'm not going to say my morning routine works every single morning, but most mornings I try to wake up early, whether that's 5.30, 6, 6.30. I try to meditate every single morning and every single afternoon. I try to maintain as strict a diet as I can. It's hard with the amount that I travel. Um, what else? Uh, I try to do my Wim Hof method and my cold showers. I try to do excruciatingly hard workouts at CrossFit. Be and I, I think the secret to my success is taking willpower out of the equation. I've uh, been really influenced by Benjamin Hardy, who's become a good friend of mine and led a challenge for my members only mastermind all about eliminating willpower. So yeah. if I want to do a really, really hard workout, I know that I'm not going to push myself to the point where my heart rate's 188. I, I'm just not, but I can go to CrossFit gyms instead of normal workouts. And there I know that I will get pushed because everyone's going to be watching and the coach is going to be watching. So I definitely am more compassionate with myself, but I do structure myself in such a way. And I try to structure my life in such a way that it has forcing functions. I try not to have sweets and candy and carbohydrates and grains in the house. Uh, so that it's just easier to do the things that I've already committed to doing. Yeah, and well, exactly. And I think willpower is definitely finite, um, particularly late at night when you've been at work all day. Uh, willpower is depleted. So if you've got, say, the a bag of Doritos in the cupboard, you get a little bit peckish, uh, you're probably going to reach for that bag. But if it's not there, uh, you're far more likely to reach for, I don't know, a carrot or a protein bar or something a little bit healthier than um, that bag of uh, potato chips or, or Doritos or wherever, whatever it is. So I think environment design is absolutely key, particularly if you want to look at your phone less, perhaps put your phone in a different room or have the Wi-Fi turn off at a particular time so you can't actually access the internet. It's such a big thing, but so many people seem to rely on willpower um, to force habit change. Oh, yeah. And as Ben says, willpower doesn't work. Yeah. It just doesn't work. We're not we're not evolved for willpower, period. And, uh, you know, I, another thing that I think is interesting is like you have to remember also when you when you beat yourself up, when you are hard on yourself because you missed the morning meditation or you skip the morning workout. I skipped the morning workout this morning because I realized I wasn't going to have time to get a meditation and a workout and a shower before the podcast. Uh, what you need to remember is is. And this isn't an excuse, but remember that the average is pretty bad, right? Mm. I always think about that when I go and get blood tests and they're like, well, you're, you know, you're oh, such and such level is on average. <laughs> and I'm like, well, yeah, but you know, 56% of people in Western countries are obese mm -hmm. and something like 70% of people work out less than twice a month or something like that, that 90% of people work out less than once a week. And so uh, always kind of beware of those averages yeah. and at the same time, try not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. If you missed one workout, you're still doing great, yeah. right? 
and and there's this there's a so-called what the hell effect. Another thing that I learned through hosting this mastermind, I learned from Andy Ramage of uh, One Year No Beer. They're a behavioral change uh, company. Is there something called the what the hell effect, which is like, well, I already had one beer, I might as well have six, or you know, I had a muffin with breakfast, so my whole day is gone, and I might as well. But that's that's irrational thinking, irrational mm-hmm. behavior, to go. You know, I, I missed my morning workout, so screw it. I'm not going to meditate. I'm not going to journal. I'm not going to do my Wim Hof method, and I'm not going to do my cold shower. That's ridiculous. But that's how we all operate. So instead, realize like you're still ahead of the game. You're still ahead of the average, and don't let one thing throw you off for the rest of the day, week, or month. Yeah, yeah. And I just want to thank you for actually being transparent and open about that because there's so many so-called uh, tech, entrepreneurship, startup luminaries who will just beat their chests and talk about the 4.30 a.m. wake-up call, the 14-hour days, the gym session every day, the new tropics, the meditation, just the full gamut of things you can do to optimize yourself. Um, but I never really open and vulnerable about the fact that Today, I actually didn't wake up at 4.30. Today, I actually didn't put that workout in. And I think a lot of people who are thinking about getting into, whether it's entrepreneurship or are starting to make those changes in their lives, may compare themselves to such people and think, well, I can't do that. Or they may try to be a uh, Jocko willing type of character. They can't maintain that sort of pace and they end up giving up altogether. So I think it's definitely um, worthwhile just you know, showing the fact that we are a little bit vulnerable and there are days where we don't put in the workout. There are days where we don't do the meditation routine, whatever it is, um, because I think that's just a lot more real. And as Aristotle um, said, you know, people cultivate virtues uh, at levels between deficiencies and excesses. You know, we're striving to be virtuous, as virtuous as we can possibly be, or as superhuman as we can possibly be, but it's just striving. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I used to shy away from disappointing my audience. And then mm-hmm. I realized that I can serve them much more by sharing and, and being real and being human. Yeah. And, and the reality is also I benefit from it. Like one of my biggest realizations in launching this mastermind community that I launched is I get as much value, if not more than the people I'm serving because I'm accountable to them. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's just such an incredible thing to have. I think we're at 170 people now, mm-hmm. 170 people expecting that I'm going to make that workout. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. And I think that that vulnerability is so, so powerful. I've recently um, had Robert Green on the show and he talked about this notion of a mask and a shadow, how we're all walking around uh, with masks on because that um, essentially presents us in the way that society wants us to be perceived essentially. Um, but we all have these shadow traits. And I wrote this blog post about my underlying shadow traits, such as, say, self-absorption and insecurity and all these things that we're uncomfortable talking about. And I published that. And I had a whole slew of emails um, in my inbox from people that said, thanks so much for being so open and honest and vulnerable. Um, I think it's great that you actually did that because sometimes we can listen to your show and it just sounds like you're superhuman, but I'm definitely not. And um, I think taking mm-hmm. time to do that actually builds better relationships with your audience. Totally, totally. And just think of all the people that you can help who go, wait a minute, you know, Steve also goes through that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think Tim Ferriss really opened my eyes to that when he talked about, you know, he has a long history of suicidal yes. thoughts Yes. and people don't realize that. And that encouraged me to share my own and, and much, much more darkness that's in my past. Uh, Mm. because first off, I think it's, it's an amazing opportunity to help other people who are where you were, but it's also super cathartic. Mm. And, and we all have, I I don't know about you, but I know quite a few thought leaders, uh, and we all suffer from imposter syndrome. And the best way to deal with that is head on and face it and be like, Hey, I missed the workout this morning and I'm feeling insecure about it. And I want to be honest and open about that. Yeah. Hundred percent, man. Um, so, I mean, you had your own struggles with uh, depression uh, going back to, say, high school, and then you're on all sorts of prescription medicine. I mean, what actually got you out of that? Was it the building your self esteem through um, re- performance and results at Berkeley? Um, was it? Um, I imagine a number of different variables that impacted that. I mean, just for our audience's benefit, I'd love to understand what got you out of that um, bout with depression. Yeah. So, I think first. I didn't realize recently, uh, until recently, I didn't realize how much chemical balance helped Mm. because along about the time, shortly after I went on Ritalin, 
I started succeeding in school and I started building my business and it all kind of came together at the same time. And I went off Ritalin years ago mm -hmm. and started to just experience my mood despite business success, despite having a healthy relationship, all this other stuff started experiencing my mood decline, 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 decline over six months and kind of reaching a rock bottom point of depression, anxiety attacks, all kinds of nasty stuff. So I think part of it, I can't deny that there was some influence, although Ritalin is in a depression medication. I think there's a history in my family of depression. Mm -hmm. My great grandmother, I believe, took her own life. Um, and so there was definitely some chemical assistance there. And at the lowest low of my most recent bout of depression, I went on Lexapro and that started to help me and pick me back up and, and put me back in a good place. But it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. And so for me, my current anti-depression, anti-anxiety regimen, in addition to prescription medication to kind of keep me even keel, at least for the time being till I can get off of it, is meditation, really intense workouts, lots of sunshine, healthy diet. I mean, it's all the things that I talk about every single week on the podcast yeah. as ways of improving yourself. But what I've realized is that they're actually necessary and required for me, mm. that um, it, it may just be that my, my physiology is predisposed to depressive tendencies or bouts of depression. Um, you know, I spent years and years depressed as an adolescent thinking it was my environment. It may be my physiology. Uh, and that's something after this year of stress and marriage and travel and growing my business that I want to explore and see if I can go off of all the medications mm. and see see how I do. But at the end of the day, if I have to take a 10 milligram little white pill every single evening uh, to avoid being fatalistic and depressed yeah. and anxious, that's not the end of the world. So I definitely don't look down on anyone. I know there's there's a tendency to take the all natural route, but in reality, some people just aren't chemically balanced. And I, I may be one of them. I'm not sure yet. Yeah. And I, th I think that's a great point because so many people, whether it's depression or, or whatever that imbalance is towards, I mean, people have biological predispositions towards lots of different behaviors. And I think once we realize that and can see that we tend to judge people a lot less because you are often a byproduct of your biological predispositions, your past experiences, your upbringing, so many different factors. And there's so, only so much free will one actually has. Um, on on uh, mood regulation, are you familiar with Matt Walker's new book, Why We Sleep? I've really wanted to have him on the show, but I haven't been able to reach him. Yeah, no, he's fantastic. And one thing he talks about in the book, which really struck me because so for so many years, I'd beat my chest and, you know, five hours sleep a night, that's all I need. And then I read that, Unless you get eight hours sleep a night as often as possible, what he suggests is that you're missing out on that deep REM sleep, which usually occurs between the sixth mm -hmm. and eighth hour of sleep, um, which is fundamental for not only creativity, but also mood regulation. And I found that after years of getting, you know, six hours sleep a night, I was quite irritable and um, just more anxious than I'd ever been. And then I started sleeping the additional, say, one to two hours. And it has just been you know, it's had a profound change in my mood. So I'm not sure what your sleeping patterns are like now, but that for me was a massive game changer. Yeah, yeah definitely. Our, our second challenge, second monthly challenge in the mastermind was with Nick Littlehills, mm -hmm. who's the sports sleep coach to Cristiano Ronaldo awesome. and Real Madrid and all these other. So we've been doing a lot of work on sleep and that's such an important aspect for overall health, not just mental. Fantastic. And one thing um, I wanted to touch on, man, was your email use, because I think, I mean, that's not the best segue in the world, but ultimately people can have quite a, say, negative relationship with technology, whether it's their smartphone, whether it's checking email every five minutes, and that's been shown to cause stress, depression, um, and, and various other ailments. Now, in your case, you've got a pretty, mm, shall we say, unconventional way of managing your email. I mean, how do you go about it? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, unconventional is, uh, is an understatement. <laughs> uh, so first off, I start with the assumption that email is not my friend. Email is a nuisance to me and email is not work. Mm -hmm. Email is talking about work. Uh, for some people it might be work. If you're a customer service, uh, rep, it's work, but chances are email is not work. Even if mm -hmm. you're a salesperson, email is not work. It's talking about work. Work yep. is actually closing the deal. Um, and so 
I acknowledge that email is someone else's priorities for my time, and I do everything in my power to discourage it. So first things first, all my emails get auto-replied with an email that says I don't, pro you know, it's, it's nicely written, but it essentially says I check my email once or twice a week, and I don't promise to write back. Um, and it, you know, I received your email, I'll read it, but I don't promise that I'm going to write back. Mm -hmm. And that right away, uh, discourages quite a few people from emailing me. I also, <laughs> you know, act on that. I check my email only on Mondays and Thursdays and in batches. So I'll do, I think generally I do about an hour a week of email. Yep. Um, wow. I'm guilty of checking once in a while on the phone because we've had some instances where there've been emergencies and somehow it only gets to me by email. But for the most part, uh, I really don't spend a lot yeah. of time on email. And then we've moved most of our communication to Asana and Slack, which is a whole other problem. I mean, Slack kills my productivity because I'm constantly on there with my team mm. chatting. So that's, that's the next thing that's going to have to go. But uh, overall, yeah, I definitely, um, I definitely try to shy away from email and I try to train the people in my life not to email me. Yeah. I think the average executive checks email something like 72 times a day. So to only spend one hour a week on it is pretty good. Although now you've got this other problem, which um, uh, Jason Fried talked about uh, from Basecamp on my show around um, asynchronous communication, uh, whereby Slack, email, all these tools, um, they're only as good as how you use them. And Slack can be used for good. But if you've got that little red notification popping up and you just constantly falling victim to it and responding to uh, group chats and things of that persuasion in Slack, then like you said, it can be a productivity killer. So we need to be super intentional about how we use these tools, which are supposedly going to make us more efficient. Oh my God. Yes. I realized like I went through a period where I wasn't feeling productive, which, you know, I teach courses on productivity. I usually feel pretty damn productive. And so I dug into my statistics. I have a, a software that tracks my statistics of what I'm doing at all times. Mm -hmm. And I realized that over the course of, what was it? It was over the course of 90 days, I had spent something like 80 hours on Slack. Wow. So out of three months, I'd spent two entire work weeks just on Slack. Yeah. It was two or four. It was a lot. And, uh, and that was a big wake up call that I'm just spending way too much time. So we moved to team meetings and now I have an hour and a half meeting every week with my whole staff and everything just comes out there. And I have people take notes of what they want to talk about for an entire week leading up to that meeting. So unless it's urgent, it doesn't go on Slack. Yeah. Was that, uh, but using, we're still improving. Was that rescue time that you used to track your, uh, time on different yes. applications? Yeah. Fantastic. I love rescue time. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. And I think just putting things into perspective like that, like for example, in my case, it was, uh, smartphone time and it was something like, uh, four hours a day at one point. And I looked at that and I thought, wow, wow. that's actually eight weeks a year. Um, and that really puts things into perspective, particularly when you take sleep out of the equation, you're basically spending half your time either at work or looking at your phone and very little time actually living. Um, so understanding, right. yeah, understanding where you are today will put you in a position to take action. And now I'm looking at my phone for less than an hour a day. And a lot of that is work related, but man, it is so easy to just get carried away and just be sucked back into the vortex of uh, social media and, and your inbox and blogs and things of that persuasion on your phone. And essentially, that's how they've been engineered. A lot of these apps is to pull us back in oh, and yeah. get that little dopamine hit. But uh, that's perhaps a conversation for another podcast episode. We are almost out of time. One thing I wanted to touch on, dude, was your podcast, Becoming Superhuman, um, which our audience should definitely check out. You're about 210 episodes in. You've had Awesome guests like Dave Asprey on recently, Jersey Gregoria, Chris Voss, um, and countless others. Well, 207 others to be precise. Um, <laughs> how do you find the, the podcast has actually aided your learning? Because I know for me, it's been absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. So I'll say the, the first year or two were just incredible. I know so much more about health and life and biohacking mm. than I could possibly have known. And, and part of the reason, look, I could listen to someone else's podcast with all of these people and learn the same stuff, but I won't, you know, yeah. <laughs> for some reason I've realized that I need to feel that I'm creating and doing something productive. It's the same reason instead of listening to the genius network podcast, I pay obscene amounts of money and fly across the world to actually sit in the room when the lectures are recorded. Uh, I need to feel engaged. Yeah. I need to feel that I'm part of the learning experience as do all adults. So I don't actually listen to podcasts, but if I'm interviewing the guests, 
I get to ask my own questions first off. Uh, I get to build relationships with them and I'm actually engaged and I'm learning. So I've definitely learned a lot. I will say the biggest value for me has been one exposure awareness. I mean, people stop me on the street uh, about the podcast more than about anything else that I do, whether it's books or courses. And the other thing is just the relationships that have come out of it. Um, you know, creating content with people, building businesses with people, helping people. I mean, um, I don't think I could get to these people if I just sent them a cold email. Yeah, couldn't agree more. I've got um, Michael Shermer on the show next week, who was on Joe Rogan's show like two weeks ago. And, you know, if I didn't have a podcast and I just emailed him saying, hey, man, can we chat for an hour? Obviously, he's going to say no, but you've got an audience behind you and it just opens the door to so many awesome conversations. And like you said, relationships as well, um, which is fantastic. Um, Want to wrap up with a self-serving question, Jonathan. You're the, you're the super learner, man. You're the super learner guy. Um, I guess right now what I'm doing, I'm learning how to surf and I really suck at it. If you were to (laughs) apply your learning mechanisms to surfing, what are three key things I should be doing to radically increase my ascension to becoming a competent surfer? Yeah. I mean, one of the first and most powerful things you can do is just isolate the 20% of things that are going to make 80% of the difference. I once spent a couple hours trying to learn surfing as well. And I Mm -hmm. I pretty quickly identified that there were two or three things that I could do differently that would help me much more than all the other things. Right. So like how I paddle, not going to make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Right. Once I'm up, I'm up. Um, And so identify those things first and figure out like, what are the things that you should focus on later when you get to mastery, you know, when you've been driving for 20 years, you can start doing all kinds of things like tricky downshifts and rev matches. But when you're first starting to drive, you need to focus on just one or two or three things, Mm -hmm. whether that be what's my speed, where are my hands on the wheel and where's the gas and brakes. And we all know that experience of learning to drive and there's so much happening and so much going on today. We do it naturally. We could do it in our sleep. So focus on those things and find those first things that are actually going to make the difference. Uh, on top of that, structure your practice because it's a muscle memory thing with Mm -hmm. surfing structure your practice in such a way that maybe you're taking a nap after immediately after session so that you can move things from long-term memory to or short-term memory to long-term memory and and integrate the new synapses Mm -hmm. and then um what else surfing is a challenging one because unlike so many things you can't just go again and again and again you have to wait for the waves and you have to wait for each individual wave and wait for when there's weather. So another thing I might do uh, would be visualization. Mm -hmm. So there have been studies that have shown that visualizing is almost as effective as doing the thing yourself and you can stimulate nerve growth and and synaptic growth and change in your brain and all kinds of stuff. So what I might do is I might meditate on surfing like for 20, 30 minutes a day, which is going to dramatically increase your practice. Uh, You could even go into a float tank and imagine surfing. Um, Fantastic. And I might do that because, yeah, surf, surfing, The what I think the hardest thing about learning surfing is that you just can't get as much practice if, as you want. If yeah. I want to learn to skateboard, I just go and go and go and go and go. The sun goes down, I just go find somewhere with lights and keep going and keep going. There's no conditions that stop me. And in fact, that's why surfers invented skateboarding to yeah. practice when there weren't waves. <laughs> exactly. And I live a good one hour drive from the waves, which also doesn't help me. So isolate the 80-20, structured practice and visualization. Thank you, my man. I'll apply that and I'll circle back in about three months time with the results. Um, if our audience wants awesome. to find out more about you, they can hit up the Becoming Superhuman, Becoming Superhuman podcast rather on Apple Podcasts and where all good podcasts are found. Uh, your courses can be found over at becomeasuperlearner.com. Obviously, you're on uh, Twitter at entrepreneur, N-E-W-E-R, and Facebook at facebook.com forward slash superlearner. Is there anything else you want to plug to the Future Squared audience, Jonathan? Yeah. I mean, if, if folks want to build their own business and they want to learn how to become a quote unquote thought leader and share their knowledge with the world and make a great living doing it. I also have a business called branding you dot Academy, which teaches people how to do the courses, how to do the podcasts, how to write the books and how to connect it all together and, and actually build a business where you can live from anywhere and, and travel the world and help people. Awesome. Absolutely love it. We'll add that link to the show notes for our listeners. Thanks again, Jonathan, for leaving us with so many value bombs. Uh, You've been an awesome guest and I hope you enjoy the uh, week ahead. It is my pleasure and I'll talk to you soon.
Hi guys, Steve again. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to receive a weekly email from me, complete with reflections, books I've been reading, words of wisdom, and access to blogs, ebooks, and more that I'm publishing on a regular basis, just leave your details at futuresquared.xyz forward slash subscribe and you'll receive the very next one. If you're picking up what I'm putting down, take a minute to like, share, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. It goes a long way to giving the podcast the exposure it needs so I can continue bringing you guests and conversations of the highest caliber. You can catch me on Twitter at Steve Gleveski and on Instagram at TheSteveGleveski. Until next time, hasta la vista, baby.